hands. Call your authority to reign in this place. Father, we pray. Father, let the authority of heaven now begin to reign in this place. As we sit in our seat of authority, we pray. Even now, God, in the name of Jesus, that we have authority. We have power to bind. We have power to loose. And today, we lose heaven in the room. We pray even now, God, let the authority of heaven begin to open up in this room. Even now, God, in the name of Jesus, we say, heaven, be unlocked. Heaven, be open. We pray even now, God, let the authority of heaven, oh God, open up in this place. We say, God, we sit in the seat of authority. We sit in our rightful seat. We sit in our seat of authority because you reign. Father, we pray even now, God, as we sit in the seat of authority. We pray even now, God, let miracles, let signs, let wonders begin to be released. Even now, God, God, we pray. Even now, God, Father of God, as we God, we pray as you cause your glory to rest in this place. Move, let the winds of authority blow in this place. We pray, blow, oh God, blow. Let the authority of heaven blow. Let the authority of heaven speak now, Father, because your voice is that upon many waters. We say, speak, Father, we pray, speak and demonstrate your power, your voice in this place as never before. We pray, we arise and move in authority. We arise and shift in authority. We pray, even now, God, we know who we are because we have the authority of heaven on the inside of us. We pray, we shall never be defeated. For God is the greatest power. We shall never, never be defeated. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? We have the authority of heaven and we move. We have the authority in heaven, so we shift. Father, we pray, even now, God, if God be for us, <laughs> who can be against us? We pray, even now, God. God, hey God, Father, hey God, ship it out, God, ship it out, God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. we pray, even now, God, let the authority of heaven begin to tap on and we declare it in Jesus' name. Come on and lift up a shout. Come on, come and lift up a shout. 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 Is this how we started this morning? And the King of Glory shall come inside. Let the King of Glory come in the room. Hey, let the King of Glory come in the room. Let the King of Glory come in the room. Let the King of Glory come in the room. Could you touch it? Let the King of Glory. Let the King of Glory come in the room. Let the King of Glory come in the room. Just real quick, all together, come on, say. Let the King of Glory. Oh, 
And I can feel the joy and the synergy, the energy in the room. Real quick, greet somebody. Good morning. God bless you. If you are joining us online, we welcome you. Y'all know some of y'all ain't even hugged nobody when you came in. Give somebody a hug. They said, Pastor, you just got up and started singing. We want to talk to people. Good morning. Good morning, praise team. Praise the Lord. Did you greet somebody? Put a smile on your face. These are your worship partners. Good morning. These are your praise partners, so you got to make sure you say good morning. Good morning. God bless you. Now, can we just do a praise check in the room? I just need to make sure the worshipers are in the right place. When I shout, count to three, I just want you to shout the biggest hallelujah. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me hear it. Oh, I'll say the biggest shout. One more time. One, two, three. You got one more in you this time. I want you to pull it from your depths. One, two, three. Come on, we can't live without your love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We can't live without you, Father. We acknowledge that you are holy. And we love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. We rise and declare that no one, nowhere compares to your love. You are holy. We stand and we shout. We can't live without your love. For you are holy, God. Say, oh, yeah. Everybody's 
screen if you know how much the love lord the lord loves you how good he's been to you and all that he expects to us is just a little bit just a tenth and then above that tenth you give your offering and as apostles been telling us then you can give a sacrifice if you want to be in the place of authority it's not seed time it's sacrifice time so you can give mobile our ushers are walking down the aisles now. They have envelopes. Just raise your hand if you need one. And if you know what places you're supposed to be walking in authority in, assign that to what you're giving. Assign that to your sacrifice in this moment. Hallelujah. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praising. Won't stop praising. Can't stop praise, won't stop praise, can't stop praise, won't stop praise, can't stop praise. If you're ready for us to pray over your over your sacrifice, over your tithe, I'm gonna ask that you stand. Just so I know that everyone's had the opportunity. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Worthy Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We magnify your name, God. And we just can't stop praising your name. I remember the song that says, can't stop praising your name. I just can't stop. 
for all the wonderful things that you have done, for the wonderful things that you are going to do in our lives. Father, we thank you now for what you have blessed us with monetarily, God, in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that you have created us to be good stewards over what you have blessed us with. Because if we are good stewards, that leads us to a place of authority. So as we have given today, Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you will bless those that have given out of obedience, that have given out of the abundance that you have blessed them with. And I thank you, Lord, that as it has been placed as seed into good ground, we thank you, Lord, that it shall be multiplied 30, 60, even 100 fold. We thank you, God, that you're going to blow our minds for our obedience. We thank you for a mind blowing blessing now over this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. They told me we was walking out. You made me sweat out my edges. I'm so sorry. And we will. At Cutting Edge, can we just lift our hands to God? Oh, come on. There's a sweet spirit in this place. There's a sweet spirit in this place. Come on. Before the song even starts, you just have your words with him. Come on. Have your words with him. Whatever that is. If it's the gifting of tongues, come on. If it's a simple, Lord, I love you, come on. You have your moment with him. Before the word comes, have your moment, have your moment. All hands lifted. Come on, this is our sign of surrenderance. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come in the room. Make us aware of your spirit. Make us aware of your glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel our hearts are ready. Thank you, Jesus.
glory. One more time from your spirit. Come on, sing, let us be. Come on, we want the presence of the Lord. We want the presence of the Lord. Why don't you lift your hands and just welcome the presence of the Lord? We welcome your presence. We welcome your presence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you that we find your word, your wisdom, and the wealth of who you are in your presence. You said that in your presence there was fullness of joy for they that dwell therein. God, we are here to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Oh, katataya. As we tent with the presence of the Lord, we expect, come on, put your expectation right there. We expect you to be God. We expect the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We expect might. We expect strength. We expect your counsel. We expect your wisdom. We expect a new and a fresh. Transform us, God. Transform us by the renewing of our mind. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Give God a praise right here. Come on, come on, clap your hands. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Glory be to your name, God. Glory be to your name, Jesus. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love, our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love, our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love, our love. I think in about 1988, that song was recorded by the Soul Children of Chicago. We are one in the spirit. And if you came out of the Methodist church, we sang. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we'll pray that all unity will one day be restored and they'll know we are Christians by our love. We've been in this series called Authority and I told you that I was going to use a letter from the word authority and today I'm going to use that letter U. And that letter U stands for unity. And I want to talk about um, the life of Joseph. And I'm going to share quite a bit. We stopped at the story um, last week. I don't even know how we got, we were able to get to it, but we were. But we stopped at the story of Judah. We talked about praise. And it's so good to hear and feel praise and since praise in the room we recognize that praise is not only a thanks but it is an admission it is admitting that I need something or that I am admitting that this is what was done for me and thereby I am giving thanks and praise unto the Lord I want to go um, into that just a little bit further this with this story with Judah but I'm going to start off here um, in this word unity understanding and recognizing understanding and recognizing that um, unity um, has a lot to do with the word that we talked about last week yibam you all remember that word Yibam, that Yibam is that word where one of the brothers is restored by the next brother. We talked through the story where um, Judah realized that he was not doing what he was supposed to do when he did not allow for Tamar, his deceased son's wife, to be restored through the rest of his sons. Until she dressed as a harlot, disguised herself, she was um, went in unto Judah, who was looking for some comfort because he was mourning. He was crying because his wife had died. He was crying, and when he came uh, to um, a place where he was looking for comfort, anybody ever been there before? Don't raise your hand. He ran into the house of a, or he thought he was in, in the room of a harlot and happened to be his daughter Tamar. She took from him. She asked of him a goat, but she took from him, because he didn't have it at the time, um, she took um, his ring. She took his crown. She took his bangles. She took his authority. Everything that signified 
that he was a king. So she took his authority, took his kingship. And it wasn't until she was pregnant that the people saw that she was pregnant. They told Judah, they said, Judah, your daughter-in-law, you know, the one where the husband is dead, she's pregnant. And he said, it's kill her. We got to stone her. She has brought shame on the family. And she, she said, well, wait a minute before you kill me. She said, I'm going to show you who I got pregnant by. And she said, do you recognize any of these things? And when he saw them, he said, those belong to me. And he said, she is more righteous than I am because of the law of Yebam. What is the law of Yebam? The law of Yebam is unity. And in particular, it is a unity that comes typically after the time of mourning. Here we go. Yeah, y'all can shut it. You, Yibam comes typically after the time of mourning. When we experience loss, say loss. loss. When we experience loss. So those of you that know uh, me by now, you know that uh, there are scheduled times on the calendar that, that I um, look at coincide with the beliefs or the culture of the Jewish people. And this season right now is Tish B'Hav. I remember preaching Tish B'Hav about maybe about 10 years ago. Amanda, uh, she had lost too. I think we had a service where quite a few people lost weight supernaturally in the service as I was teaching on Tish B'Hav. Had to be, I know, over actually over 10 years ago now. Nevertheless, this is a season of loss. And so all of Ju the, the Jewish people right now are at the, um, the West Walls, and they are crying out. They're crying out because um, they are mourning the loss of the tabernacle, of the temple. They're mourning the loss of the temple. They're mourning the loss. And if you look in Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, it talks about I wanted to get into this real deep, but I won't. I'm just going to mention it and kind of fly by, float a, uh, um, a balloon there, and you'll hear it on next Sunday. So let's pause right there. So we will not be in service next Sunday, but the war will go forth. So if you catch us online, you will get uh, the rest of this series. Be not dismayed. Amen. So again, they're celebrating, or not celebrating, they're mourning the loss. And in this story, Joseph's story, when they talk through Tishbahav and they celebrate Tishbahav, they mention a few things about the life of Joseph. His mom, her tears, his father, uh, his tears for his son. But most importantly, we see both the mother and the father, their tears, when you do a deep dive and study, you will recognize that their, their tears were a relentless tear and an e almost an everlasting tear. And here's why. Joseph is taken by his brothers, remember, thrown into the pit. They take his coat, they, give it, uh, they dip it in goat's blood, and they give it to their father, and they tell his, the father, that he must have getting, gotten eaten by wild animals. And so his father, father mourns, but he does something very particular when he mourns. If you know the Jewish people, they have a system of mourning. They either have seven days of mourning, they have 30 days of mourning, or they'll have one solid year of mourning. Jacob says something very peculiar. He says, I will go to my grave mourning my son. There is a supernatural grace that God gives us in mourning. When we know that what we have lost will be returned. Meaning that in this life, how many of you have had someone in your, in your family to pass on? In this life, we won't see him again. But in that that is to come, we will be reunited with them again. That is our belief in our Christian faith, that we will see them again. 
Jacob says he finds no restitution, no redemption in those thoughts because somehow his spirit man knows that his son is not dead. Oh. So he is locked into this place of mourning because something that is his that they're declaring is dead or lost it's not lost. It was stolen or taken. So Jacob cries out continuously. In the, in the Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, we talk about Rachel's tears. Rachel, uh, which was Joseph's mother, her tears are mentioned in Scripture for the tears that run for those that go into exile and don't return. The reason why they talk about Rachel's tears, and as a matter of fact, they state that Rachel's grave is the most visited grave in all of the world. Her grave that's in Bethlehem, it's the most visited grave in all the world. I had the honor of going to Israel and Egypt and Jordan and all of these different places and I saw begin to see all of these stories and I'm going to tell you one of the things that I recognize they do a lot of walking <laughs> please get your right shoes on not even your gym shoes get them hiking to, okay <laughs> but I saw the path that they took just to go and mourn. I saw, and we were at the wailing wall where they begin to wail and, 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 you know, constantly. And I'm saying to myself often, why do we cry? Well, these individuals are crying. If you know the Orthodox Jewish people right now, they are waiting on the return of their brother. They're waiting on the return of the Messiah, the anointed one. Why? Because biblically, and I'll show you in scripture, I'm just going to give you my message now. Biblically, until there is a unification of the brotherhood, a nation cannot be restored. Until there is unity in the brotherhood, a nation cannot be birthed. Until there is unity of the brotherhood, you cannot move any further. There is no succession. So unity is important, not just because your mama don't want you to keep arguing with your, with your siblings. Anybody got in trouble for arguing with their siblings? Me and my sister, we argued all the time. Good Lord, you wouldn't believe it today. But a nation cannot be birthed. And so Jacob, I resolved this, that Jacob was not just crying for the birth, for the, for the loss of his son. He was crying because he knew the prophecy. If y'all go back three lessons ago that I taught, he was crying because he knew that the prophecy of God could not be fulfilled. If God promised Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, that a nation was going to come through him. He's not just mourning the loss of a son. He's mourning the, 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 um, the, uh, the disallowment of the blessings of God, where he then commands a blessing. So during this time, they, they grieve. They grieve and during Teshbahab, they grieve that the tabernacle, the, the temple that was destroyed. They also grieve um, believing that there's going to be a return of someone. They're looking for someone. But what's so interesting, something we know that they don't know, they can't identify their brother. Yeah. Hey. They could not, they cannot today identify their brother even though we know Jesus and believe Jesus to be their elder brother we know Jesus we believe Jesus to be the only begotten son we know him to be the son of promise that as a sign and a symbol and a wonder when the son of promise comes then the nation shall be one 
But what if you couldn't identify the sun? You would be reduced to mourning. You would go to your grave in mourning. There was something very peculiar about this season, Tish Bahavan, and the fact that they could not identify their brother, Joseph. Not being able to identify their brother, Joseph, does two things. We just stated. The father continuously cries. The prophetic word of the Lord cannot be manifested because it is sealed. Y'all know in heaven there are seals on certain commands and decrees that he has. There is a seal that is placed on the releasing of a word. Anybody ever got a prophetic word and try to figure out when it's coming? Let me say this. If it is from God, it has a seal on it. And a seal is set by a wonder. Okay. A seal is set by a wonder. Well, what is a wonder? A w- when you wonder about something, you think about it. You've got to think certain things through. You have to recognize or identify what it is. So because they could not recognize or identify jo- Joseph, not only when he was in Pharaoh's house, but even when he was in their house, They could not identify him. They were locked in this continuous cycle of not being able to see a prophetic word revealed. I'm giving y'all a lot of keys to how to unlock prophetic destinies, how to move in the timing of God, and how to restore a nation. I'm giving y'all... Quite a bit, and I haven't even gotten into my first slide. So I want to talk about this. We were, my mother and I, we were on a walk. We started walking, y'all. I lost my partner, though, a couple days to Wendy. I don't know where they went. They were supposed to be walking with me, then all of a sudden, they disappeared. So I'm walking by myself now. Oh, well. But we were on this walk, and, and she said something that sparked something. She, she, Bishop Pam talked. She's a deep woman, if, just in case y'all don't know. She's a teacher's teacher. But she started, she asked me about the coat. She said, when are you going to get into the coat of many colors? And I started to kind of give a, uh, just a deliberation on some of the things that God had been dealing with me, and I've been kind of walking through them. Uh, these past couple of months, actually, as I prepare for each series. But the Lord, the the next day I had to walk by myself. And the Lord started to deal with me about this coat again. And I said, what does this coat have to do with unity, authority, new beginning? What does this coat have to do with, with mourning? What does this coat have to do with anything? So the Lord took me on a journey, and I'm going to take you on this journey. We're going to go into Genesis, because we we are in Genesis, right, saints? We have read all of Genesis. <laughs> Genesis, reading, if you read through the, from the 30th chapter to the 50th chapter, you'll be able to stay with us. But I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, oh, it's on me, I'm sorry. Okay, so I, I forgot it was on me. I'm supposed to change my own slides today. Joseph's coat. <laughs> and we're in D- Genesis, the 37th chapter, and I'm just going to start here at the 31st verse. And it says, and they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father. And said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Do you know if this is your son's coat? This is what we found. That means that this is what they, what he recognized. This is what they recognized. This was the revelation. They recognized a coat dipped in blood. 
If you go back to what I just said a little while ago, because now Joseph's coat is dipped in blood, that Jacob is being asked to identify this. Listen to what I'm saying, y'all. I don't want it to pass you. Identify this coat. They wanted him to see the coat. The coat right now is going to represent Joseph, just Joseph. They want him to see his son in blood, which means now that this is the end of any promise that God could have revealed. They want him now to speak against the word of the Lord that was not just on his life, but was on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the generations to come. Look what they asked him to do. They shrouded this coat. That's a part of the promise because he was given the coat because he was the son of promise. He was the begotten son. Has anybody ever heard or seen or felt like your promise came back to you? People that didn't like you, shrouded in blood, and they asked you to identify it as dead. They asked you to identify your blessing, your gift, your key as dead. And not only did they say, because they didn't want to say it. They never said it. They never said that Joseph was this, that, the fifth or the third. They said, you identify it. They literally wanted the father to renounce the blessing, the will of God over their life. They wanted to disconnect and discontinue what God said. Again, this was not just about Joseph. So what does he do in response? He doesn't respond the way they tell him he was going to respond. He responds by mourning forever. Hey, why? He responds by mourning forever. He says, I will go to my grave believing God. I will go to my grave believing that my tears, my mourning season, if you're saying that my new day is not going to come, then it must mean that I've got to go to my grave mourning. But I will not renounce what God spoke over my life. You can bring it to me dead. You can bring it to me buried. You can bring it to me decrepit. You can, however you want to bring it to me. But I will not. So his crying, his mourning was not mourning for pain. His mourning was mourning for promise. He said, I am relentless in my thought life, in my belief, in my gut. I know God didn't lie to Abraham, Isaac, and me. I know what God said shall come. I may not be the one to announce it's coming, but I will not announce that it's dead. I will not release that it died. I will not release that it's over. Some of you are trying to figure out why am I still in my morning season? Hey. Is it that I miss that person this much? And if you go back, it's probably not the person. God has probably given you salve for the person. But it's the promise attached to the person. Hey. That's, that won't die that can't leave your spirit, that you know somehow, some way, you've got to fight for. So we see Joseph's coat. But I want to show you how unity is the answer. How unifying with your brother becomes the answer to an undistinguishable mourning. Uh, I'm talking about the crying. I'm not talking about the new day. 
talking about the crying. So we read about Joseph's coat. So let me just, just go on. Y'all know I'm always do it. <coughs> Unity. Unity is the state of being united or joined as a whole. According to uh, Genesis 2 and 24, and y'all probably know that better than you know your name, but Genesis 2 and 24 simply, um, simply says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, why did I go here? Because I want to talk about the type of unity that God is talking about in Scripture as it pertains to how we restore authority to get the promises of God. I'm going to say it again. How we restore authority to get, to see the manifested promises of God. All right. So in Genesis, for those of you that have never read the, the, the story, I'm going to just kind of give it to you quickly. Adam and Eve. Adam was, um, was tilting the field. He had dominion in the earth. He was looking for a mate. Could not find a mate. He literally looked for a mate. It wasn't until God put him to sleep and out of his side, out of him, out of his rib, God then formed his wife out of his rib. What did he do? He cut him open. He slit him open. Opened up his skin, which is his first coat. Took out his wife. Built him a woman. And they became one. This was the first coat that was cut. <laughs> skin. Skin is our biggest organ. Skin is an organ that, trust me, I got all these mosquito bites because <laughs> of these walks. And I've been sweating like them. Man. But it's a barrier. It lets stuff go out and allows things to come in. It is your largest absorbing organ. And it is the only organ that you have, organ, on the outside of your body. Organ. Any doctors in here? This organ <laughs> is important for passageway, for what gets in and what gets out to determine the safety or the health of who you are whole. Your coat, your skin. So your coat is a very important feature that determines and establishes you and everything that makes you healthy. Bible declares, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. We know that this is the, the, the blessing of the Lord, the dream of the Lord, um, the intent of the Lord. He wants us to be healthy and holy. He wants us to, um, to be able to, uh, even in this process, he wants us to be able to judge what comes in and what goes out. This is why then the husband had to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife by decision. So when you see coats, you're going to also see decisions. Follow coats. And you're also going to see loss. So this husband has to lose the mother and father and cleave to his wife. This is a principle of the coat. Unity, oneness, and becoming one flesh. This is the wife and the husband now being knit together. So where do the, we see this? 
Again, I just read that we saw this when Jacob, I'm sorry, yeah, when Jacob was given his son's coat, and we recognized then that the coat was what, dipped in blood, and the promise of the coat was then um, challenged, right? And we see that when the challenge or when, this, when the, the death of his son was challenged and he would not relent to the fact that he would mourn until he died because God's promise was going to be revealed. I'm taking it slow because I want y'all to hear these words in context so you can pull it out spiritually for why some of the things keep dying in your life, why some of the promises keep dying in your life and you're not able to manifest what God truly wants for you. So I'm going to talk about another coat. So we're talking about unity. I want to talk to you about Jonathan's coat. First Samuel. And you're going to see something else you probably didn't realize. But in, in 1 Samuel, the 18th chapter, and I'm going to read starting at the first verse to the fourth verse. And it says, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Hold on. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his girdle. Y'all see that? Now, I'm actually going to take you to 1 Samuel. I wanted y'all to read that first. Because as you read it, you see that David was talking to Saul the king. Saul the king, I'm going to read it in a minute, says something to David. David and Jonathan then have this unusual exchange. Now, he was talking to his daddy. But why now do we see Jonathan giving him his coat, giving him his sword, giving him his garment? Why is he giving him all of these things? Let's go back to 1 Samuel 17 and 58. And Saul said to him, whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. That's all. He asked him that question. After he asked him that question, have you ever asked yourself then, why did that make Jonathan soul tie? Why did that one statement, because see, Saul had known David before. David had come and played the harp for him before. David had come and killed the Philistine uh, before. And so now, all of a sudden, because I know who your daddy is, now not Saul, but the son says, I'm going to give you everything. And he fell in love with him. What happened here? Well, this is what happened. Who is David? <laughs> Jacob had two sons, Judah and Benjamin. Judah had a son. His name was Jesse. Jesse had a son. His name is David. Benjamin had a son, King Saul. King Saul had a son, Jonathan. So from last week to this week, what do you see being fulfilled? Yeba. You see again Yebum being fulfilled. 
This noun becomes from the time of Joseph now to Jonathan and David. This is why David was the king then that restored all 12 tribes. Because now, remember what Judah had done for Benjamin. Remember he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to stay on behalf of my little brother Benjamin you, he could go back to his daddy because his daddy's soul was knit. His daddy's soul was knit to his father. And if we take John and Benjamin away, then he is going to die. He says, so I will lay down my life for my brother. Not six generations later. The one who laid down his life for his brother, now that brother is laying down his life for him. And at the unity of these brothers, something happens so significant. Their souls tie. I know y'all probably had all of these sex education Christian sex education classes about soul ties that I hate to tell you, but they have no biblical credence. None. Zero. The way that people have been teaching about soul ties is laughable. You don't see any sexual soul ties ever, ever. E-V-E-R in scripture. You are not tied to souls because of sex. You are tied to souls because of sacrifice. So if you sacrifice who you are, and you sacrifice the promise on your life, you can sadistically soul tie to somebody who has now captured your future. Because a soul tie is when Yebum is restored. When you lay, any time you lay down your life, say, I don't want my life no more. I'm just going to sleep with him, her, this, that, the fifth, and the third. I don't want God's plan for my life, or I'm going to, I'm going to subjugate it, or I'm going to usurp it, and I'm going to soul tie to something that I ain't got no business. Yeah, you could do that. But it's because what you're, what you're actually doing is you're performing yibam. And you're giving your life, not just your body. You're giving the promises associated to your life to them. But because Jesus the Christ, come on somebody, Pastor Aries sang it, he, they hung him high, he stretched him wide, he bowed his head, and for me he died. Now because he then took his coat off, oh God be glorified, <laughs> and he died for you, it can break a soul tie. The only thing that breaks a soul tie is even being fulfilled. So then how did we become a nation? Now, what's so interesting is, and I'm not supposed to even go to this part, but what's so interesting is that right after that moment, right after Jonathan and David become one, because now the law of Yibam is fulfilled, almost 400 years has come to a complete and divine circle. And now all of the house of Israel, Saul finally recognizes that it's not going to be him that's going to restore the house. Like his great-great-grandfather, Judah. I'm sorry, Benjamin. I'm sorry, Benjamin. He was not, even though he was the beloved, and Benjamin's name, remember I told y'all last week, Benjamin's name 
means power, excellency. So Saul fought battles. Right after this, if you go in chapter 18 and keep reading then, what happens to Saul? Right after that, there is a group of women who start singing. And they say, Saul killed a thousand. David killed 10,000. Not only is he finding out that he's not in the son of power anymore, but that there's somebody else that has more power or more range than he does. And he believes that's out of season. That's, that's, that's out of what you were called to do. That's out of your name. And so I, I'm not supposed to be preaching this part right now, but this is why there is, there is a strong, for me, there's a, long, a strong in, internal theological debate about Saul's inability to love David. Because then what he began to, what he understood was now that David, being in this place, unifying the brethren, unifying the tribes, unifying the people, was displacing him as a son. And he no longer felt recognized or he, no longer was he able to identify himself as the strong warrior or the son of power like his tribe is supposed to be. I'm not going to move slow, I'm going to move faster. I want to just share this quickly. Psalms uh, 126. These are the scriptures that I read when we're dealing with, and, and tell the team they can come on. They ain't got to go too far. Psalms 126, this is the restoration. This is a song that is saying is the restoration. When the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion, we were like that dream. What are they talking about? They're, and long story short, they're talking about Joseph's ability to dream and Joseph's dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south that so tear that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing the sheaves with him. This is Psalms 126. This is uh, Joseph's dream revealed. This was also why. They were upset at Joseph. They were upset at Joseph because Joseph had the dream of the sheaves that bowed down and of the, of the stars that bowed down to the moon. The fulfillment of this scripture is uh, two things, that you would turn away from captivity, but also that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth and weepeth bearing precious seeds shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing the sheaves with him. This is, this is the story of Jacob. This is the song that Jacob sang in, um, in, in, in stark uh, contrast to this Psalms 133. We read this. Psalms 133 says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon or Zion and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. I could stop right there. The reason that we needed the soul tap was for verse 3. God cannot command or make manifest a blessing. Mm. Some of you, a blessing, a blessing can be spoken over you. A blessing can be given to you. But when it is commanded by God for you, that is when it comes in its manifested glory and state. But it cannot come into its glory and state until you do these things. 
until you, verse 1, brethren, dwell together. So why hasn't certain things manifested in your life, explicitly the things that you're still crying about? Because there's somewhere in your life where you have not completed Yibam, where you have not restored your brother's name, his purpose, the things that God gave you as, as a team, as a collective. There is something very specific to each nation. God gives a word. Paul, we know in the, in the New Testament, he gave a word to every state or every country. And they had to fulfill these words, right? These words. Well, he, he told one, go back to your first love. He told another one, stop what y'all are doing. He, he, to, he told each country, each ecclesia, each government to do something different. When those things were done, then the manifestation of God's anointing, his presence, his power, his prophetic word opened up over their life. Yay! Oh, I wish I had the time, but here we go. I am, I'm hovering in, in this moment. Isaiah, y'all know this scripture, and y'all know I'm a Bible thumper. 1 and 18, y'all know it. Y'all know it by heart. You just don't know, you know. It says, come now, let us what? reason together saith the Lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as wool this scripture is another reference to the time of Joseph and his brothers when his brothers finally come to him the Bible declares that they finally talk Help Jesus. They finally have a conversation. Unity comes in communication. And when we have miscommunication or missed opportunities for communication, we cannot come in unity. If we cannot reason together. Most of the times, the reason why you can't fulfill Yibam, the reasons why you can't give with your brothers and sisters is because you don't know how to talk to me. Or I don't know how to talk to you. But us, and it's a skill, thank you. It's not innate. It's not blood bought. It's not just because you're my brother or my sister or my mother or my father. It is something that you have to persevere through. Oh, God. The Bible declared when Saul and David talked, then Yeban was fulfilled. When Joseph and his brothers, when Joseph stood in Pharaoh's house, when they finally talked, Yeban was fulfilled. And there was a reconciliation. I'm digging in this topic, unity, because I was preparing for, in a couple of weeks, uh, I have a leadership uh, conference with all of the leaders here in this church, and God began to deal with me about miscommunication. Because I asked the Lord, why were certain things not being fulfilled? We've got instructions. We've got protocols. We have SOPs. We have KPIs. We have all these kinds of things. And he told me specifically it, there is a miscommunication. I have to stop here because I want to. I want to keep going, but I guarantee you that we're going to we're going to come back to these thoughts. I probably I think I only got two more slides, and I'll I'll come back to them. Yeah. Oh, Lord, I want to do it. I'm just, <laughs> look, y'all like, do it. I'm, I'm just going to go here in Genesis 37. Read Genesis 37. Oh, okay. Genesis 37 and 4. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and what? And could not speak. 
peaceably unto him. Anybody in here have not spoken to your brothers, your sisters? Genesis 45 and 15 says, moreover. <laughs> he kissed all his brethren. He kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. Disunity because of miscommunication or no communication has been robbing us of our authority, has been robbing us of the ability to come together as a nation unified where there is peace and joy and love everlasting where we literally stand in and stay in the promises of God that are yea and amen. I know this series on authority is not necessarily how you thought it was going to go down because I keep making you bow down. I keep telling you about being broken. I keep telling you about yielding. I keep telling you about giving in to your brother or laying your life down, dying for your brother. I keep telling you about suffering through the conversation because it's worth it. Because your brother's coat is just as important as yours. Some of us need to take our coat off and lay it on our brothers and restore our houses. And until then, we won't stop our mourning because we believe God. I'm not mourning because I'm sad. I'm mourning because I know what he promised me. And I don't care what I see. I don't care about the blood. I don't care about the sayings, the circumstances. I know what God told me. Know what God told me. I want to pray. Y'all can have all of this. I want to pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For a few people, for a few things. First thing I want to pray for, those of you that the enemy tried to calls you to speak against the Bible declares that life and death is in the power of your tongue calls you to speak against the promises of God that are yea and amen see when God promises and when God prophesies he don't just prophesy to you he prophesies to the generations behind you and ahead of you his prophetic moment, his prophetic word is large. And it's always connected to the generations behind you and the generations ahead of you. Now, there are certain things that are, that are spoken over my life for, for indicators and directions. Those are not prophetic words, but those are indicators and directions and wonders. And those particular things, when I see them, I see them as a sign and a wonder. I'm grateful for those. But if it's a prophetic word over your life, and you know via your family, via your community, via whatever the call is on your life, I know that the call of education is on my life. Why? Because 15 generations ago, 15, I can count 15 generations back and more to uh, those that educated children in a school system. Standing here now, this was the first time in over 45 years that my mother had to close the doors 
to the elementary Christian school that we have had for over 45 years in 2020. But I'm not mourning because I'm sad. I will mourn until the day the Bible declares Zion comes. What happened in Zion? The brothers unified in Zion. So what has to happen in order for our school to come back? The brothers have to unify. Yibam has to be completed. God is going to do what he said he was going to do. The doors to our school closed, but they will reopen. When the brothers and the sisters talk and figure it out. Your blessings are not just yours. They were promised to you. I want to pray for those of you that understand that and know that the reason why you're suffering through things like poverty or discontentment or anything that is leaving you out of where you know you're supposed to be, whatever that circle is, that somewhere in that place you've been mourning and you thought you were mourning the loss. You're not mourning the loss no more. You're mourning until the day of his promise is fulfilled. And I want to pray for you that today is that day. Because God is going to give you the language of heaven. And he's going to cause you to speak those things that are not as though they were. And you will do Yebam as Jesus the Christ has done Yebam, as brothers in Zion have done Yebam. And you will see the command of the Lord. I prophesy to you now because I need to tell you what's in the room. There is an angel at that back door, standing at that back door. <laughs> He's been standing there for a minute. And he has the command of the Lord in his hands. <laughs> Somebody gave me their dream this week. And in this dream, it was, it was uh, Charlie Shemp. It's on his Instagram. You can look at his story. He was in heaven. And they were worshiping. And he saw people that he knew that was still alive on earth. And he saw people that he had no passed on. And they were all worshiping the Lord. Worshiping, worshiping. The Lord. And all of a sudden, these angels came to just individuals. And they would ask these individuals, what did the Lord say to you? And that person would then say, this is what the Lord said. This is what the Lord promised. And the angel then would give that person everything that they needed. All of their resources. All of the strength. Everything that they needed. And send them back to earth. But you have got to recognize what it is that God has given you to do in the earth. Identify with that and I guarantee you, you're going to stop your mourning because you're going to reconcile with his word and reconcile with his son Jesus. You may not be able to reconcile with your enemies. Reconcile with his son Jesus the promises of God that are on your life that are yea and amen. And don't cut yourself short of the blessings of God by having bitterness in your heart towards your brother. I'm not going to have y'all come up here. We have an extended day. In a moment, we're going to baptize some individuals. But I want you, if that is you and you know, just at your seat, stay there. Stand at your seat if you know that that's you. You know you are the person that you've been mourning a loss. But you didn't understand that this loss was about recognizing, identifying the truth of the blessings of God on your life. Some of us have bitterness towards other people. 
And it ain't, that's not where the bitterness is supposed to be pointed. It's supposed to be toward the fact that I'm relentless. I'm not giving up. Yes, I'm crying. Yes, I'm mourning. But it's, I'm, it's not about the loss anymore. It's about I know what his promise is. That's yeah and amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, these individuals have identified and your angel of command is here to command a blessing over them, but they must praise you now. I know that's right. You can. So, Father, I pray the strength of God on them now that they would begin to praise you in advance because your promises are sure. Your promises are yea and amen. I decree that now you would command Psalm 133, Psalm 126 over their life. As they come and reason together. Though our sins are like scarlet, you would wash them white as snow. Wash them hmm. white as wool. Wool, wool, wool. The fabric of the coat. And you would clothe us again in your righteousness. For the authority of your righteousness commands a blessing on us now. I decree and declare the blessing of the Lord. If you believe God for that, clap your hands and praise him now. Hi, Cutting Edge Global family. August is almost here and we have some exciting news to share about an upgraded connection for you, our online community. Cutting Edge Global is upgrading and we are dedicating the entire month of August to do so. We've started renovating in our in-person location, but we have not forgotten about our online family. For the month of August only, we will be shutting down our in-person location and joining our virtual family online. We have a three-step process that we believe will elevate your online experience and engagement with your family here at Cutting Edge Global. This is the way that we plan to upgrade our connection online. Step one, consider. We want to hear from you. If you are a member and have completed your member profile, someone from our care team will email you an email link. If you have not completed your profile, it's okay. You can still complete the survey in our app. This survey is designed for you to consider your online experience with Cutting Edge Global and how we can best improve your connection. Step two, call. When God calls us into a place in Him, He doesn't leave us without a tutor or a governor. We have developed partnering materials to help you grow in the office and calling that you have been called to. Materials such as certificate trainings, manuals, white labeled materials will not only be available for you, but the tribe and territory you are called to. Step three, communicate. Our website and app, newsletters, and even snail mail upgrades will include the following. Devotionals, online Sunday school, mentorship and study community, podcast and panel discussions, a book club, a professional alliance, and CETV. We recognize that many of you are waiting for the opportunity to carry out God's vision for your life with dominion and authority. We believe that ultimately this will help increase your supernatural connection with Holy Spirit and the gifts and graces God has given unto each of you. Cutting Edge is about making sure we make an impact in every sphere of influence by His will, His way. We know that the church is not a building, but the governmental assembly of the saints, even online. We will continue our authority series through Sunday service and midweek cup Bible study streaming each week online. Trust this process God has given us to encourage yourself to find ways to intentionally connect and engage on purpose with God's people. That's right. Cutting Edge is making room for an upgraded connection.